So I am going to start debunking and just responding to some of the anti, anti-Iran, anti pro-Israel propaganda that we see uh, on the internet. So if you know a particularly bad video from one of these Zionists, uh, send it my way and I will react to it on the air. What's neat about this is usually before I react to a video, I watch it once just so I can, you know, be prepared. I don't, you know, um, but this time uh, I'm going to be seeing stuff fresh. So if you know a particularly bad pro-Israel, pro-Zionist video, maybe send it my way. Uh, the first one I'm going to react to is from Jordan Peterson. Um, and it's an anti, anti-Iran anti video that he made, um, you know, uh, about, uh, it's called um, Hamas Puppets. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to react to that. Uh, so I'm just going to put it on, um, you know, and we're going to react to Jordan Peterson and his disinformation propaganda about Iran. Now by Dr. Jordan Peterson. Uh, Jordan, great to have you back on the program. Oh, this is great. It's not just Jordan Peterson. It's Jordan Peterson uh, with Piers Morgan. The, do you support Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas guy? So, wow, this will be a balanced interview. I'm sure he'll really challenge Jordan on this. There we go. A lot has happened since you were last on just a few weeks ago. Uh, I want to start by saying that I, I'm wrestling with a lot of moral quandaries about this war. Oh, I'm hoping- yeah, I'm so sure you're wrestling. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Mainstream Media and Pierce, Pierce Morgan. I'm sure you're, you're wrestling. You're wrestling. Oh, give me a break. In the, through our conversation today, we might get to at least have some clarity about the moral quandaries and see if we can mm-hmm. uh, work out what we should be thinking about this. Because- All right, yeah, clarity on the moral quandaries. Ultra-Zionist YouTube and former CNN host versus ultra-Zionist Canadian conservative anti-communist guy. Yeah, we're going to get some real wrangling here. Oh, boy. Because I think it's very complicated um, and it's got to be nuanced. Very, very complicated. I mean, Israel has been oppressing the Palestinians for God knows how long, uh, since long before Israel was even established. They've been terrorizing the Palestinians. They've been bombing Gaza and destroying Gaza. And uh, the Palestinians resisted on October 7th. And then Israel went on a killing spree. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for the complicated part. And the whole world has been telling Israel uh, to, you know, have a ceasefire and Israel doesn't have a ceasefire. So where's the complicated part? I don't know. I mean, it's like David and Goliath. Was that complicated? This conversation. Do, do you feel any moral quandaries about it? Well, I don't think you can have a war without moral quandary. I mean, a war is the consequence of an unsolvable moral quandary. And so it's not surprising that the conversation surrounding the war is full of moral quandaries, because if, if it was straightforward and simple, and if there was an easy path forward, then there wouldn't be a war. Oh, so deep. Isn't Jordan Peterson so deep? I mean, he's probably read at least two Solzhenitsyn books. I mean, he's just the genius of philosophy. You know, I, you know, sometimes when he's talking psychology, he does say intelligent things, but he knows absolutely nothing about politics, especially nothing about Marxism or anti-imperialism. It's like, oh, yes. I mean, it's like there's so many people that just swoon over Jordan Peterson. Like he's the smartest human being that ever existed. And it's like, listen to him here. He's just a blathering. You know, he just throws out these. Oh, yes. Well, of course, there's moral quandaries in a war. And then pe- there's there's people looking at this in their phones going, whoa amazing. This is the smartest man who ever existed. I'm going to go clean my room. And so, I mean, I'm, I can tell you what I think is going on to the degree that you can reduce it to something quickly explicable. You know, I think Iran is desperate because of the tenuous hold on power that the mullahs now have. How is Iran desperate? Right. The Islamic Republic has been in power since 1979. It's built that country up and industrialized the country. They've got allies all over the region who stand with them and support them. The whole Arab world is admiring the Houthis that are Iran's allies for what they they're doing, fighting Israel. I I don't know. How how is Iran desperate? Iran is anything but desperate. The USA has tried to overthrow the Iranian government so many times and they stand strong. The USA murdered Qasem Soleimani, their top general, and they stand strong. Uh, They've been trying to to destabilize Iran, and Iran just keeps getting stronger. And the Islamic Republic and the 
revolutionary anti-imperialist foundations of the Islamic Republic just keep getting stronger. I'm waiting for how in the world is Iran desperate? How is Iran desperate? That is absolutely ridiculous. Iran is the center of resistance to Israel at a time that the whole world hates Israel. Iran has is in the ideal position right now. Basically, Iran has made itself the anti-Israel country, and Israel is the most hated country in the world for what it's doing to Gaza right now. So Iran is not in a weak position at all. Saudi Arabia just reestablished diplomatic relations with them. There are trains that go from Moscow to Tehran to Riyadh, right? Iran has joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Iran is in a really good spot right now. So yeah, that's bullshit. In Iran, given their own citizens' rebellion, I think- No, no, the, the, the citizens' rebellion ended a long time ago. You do realize that. And it was just the rich kids who went out, the people that, that are looking at this all day long and, and you know, are looking at Twitter and Facebook and think that the, 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 the West is an ideal place. And it ended a long time ago. And the Islamic Republic of Iran is far more secure today than it has been in a long time because Rouhani and the reformist movement completely fell on their faces. Um, they see the Abraham Accords, which were the most significant step forward towards peace in the Middle East for like 75 years. Uh, the Abraham Accords involved Bahrain, a very tiny country, and the United Arab Emirates, a very tiny country, and Tunisia, which is in North Africa. It's not really in the Middle East. It's a North African country establishing diplomatic relations with Israel. Three very, very insignificant Islamic countries establishing diplomatic relations with Israel as a favor to Donald Trump. And now that has completely fallen to pieces. So yeah, yeah, you know, uh, oh, the Abraham Accords were so great. No, no, they weren't. They see the Abraham Accords as an existential threat. This is a last ditch attempt by the Iran no. They don't see the Abraham Accords as an existential threat because now all the countries that signed it are looking disgusting to the Muslims of the world. They're embarrassed, right? The Abraham Accords put Iran in a very good position to accuse Saudi Arabia and other countries, uh, you know, that are that are kind of helping helping the countries that did sign the Abraham Accords along uh, in pro being pro Israel. Iran is, I mean, the Abraham Accords actually made Iran look really good. And all the countries that are collaborating with the United States, all the Muslim countries, it made them all look really, really bad. And now since October 7th and since Israel's bombing, they all look really, really bad. All those countries that signed the, Israel, the, the Abraham Accords are all looking at themselves in shame and embarrassment right now. Uh, the whole Muslim world is saying, wow, how dare anyone even think about recognizing Israel? So no, the Abraham Accords... All of this is completely, he has no idea what he's talking about. Iranian mullahs to use the Islam against Jews story to prop up their own dismal reign. And so they rattled the chain of their Hamas puppets and said, Oh my God, they're Hamas puppets. They're Hamas puppets. You do realize that Hamas are Sunnis, Iran are Shias. Hamas is the Palestinian wing of the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. It is not they're not puppets. Hamas gets funded by Qatar. It gets funded by Turkey. It gets funded by Saudi Arabia. Uh, Hamas gets funded by all kinds of different countries throughout the region. And Hamas has actually gone out of its way to diss Iran on a number of occasions. Now, there is a group in Palestine, in Gaza, called the Islamic Jihad in Palestine that is more Iranian aligned. But Hamas are not puppets of Iran. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. No one who knows anything about Middle Eastern conflict would say that, right? Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood current, which is what Hamas comes out of, right? Hamas was originally the Palestinian wing of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Shia Islamic revolutionary current of Iran are not the same at all. In fact, Hamas was on the wrong side in Syria. Hamas sent fighters to fight against Assad in Syria, whereas Iran was on the side of the Syrian government in Syria. Uh, you know, I, I mean, this is just he doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. That's that's a stupid. Right. You know, oh, well, Iran hates Israel and Hamas hates Israel. So they must all they must be puppets. This is idiotic. Provoke. And they did. And their hope is that the Israeli response will be so overwhelming that the Arab world turns against them. And maybe even the people who might be inclined to you know, be swayed by a victim narrative in the West and that the Abraham Accords will fall apart and. 
and that'll be the end of that. And well, that, you know, maybe if Israel had only bombed Gaza for a month, uh, they wouldn't be so isolated now. Maybe if they'd only bombed Gaza for two months, but I think it's Israel that's isolating itself. Israel has nonstop been bombing Gaza since October, and they've been trying to provoke a regional war. Uh, so yeah, that that's you know it's Israel is isolating itself with its own actions here. This is this is dumb. That could happen, and I'm hoping it won't because I think the Abraham Accords were, you know, and it, it's here. Like they gave him a cheat sheet and just said, say Abraham Accords as many times as you possibly can, right? He looked at a mirror before this interview and said Abraham Abraham Accords Abraham Accords Abraham Accords. Like that's he doesn't know anything. They just said somebody told him, hey, say. But the Abraham Accords are good. Irritating to me, for whatever you you know utility that is, is that I think I know, insofar as you can know such things, that Saudi Arabia would have signed the Abraham Accords two years ago if Biden would have moved a little bit more forthrightly on it. And I think the yeah, and Saudi Arabia, if they had done that, would have lost all credibility in the Muslim world. They would have completely lost any of their credibility. And so I really doubt Saudi Arabia would have done that because at this point, those countries that signed the Abraham Accords are now being looked at by the Muslims of the world as complicit in the genocide in Gaza. And I have a feeling there were a lot of people in Saudi Arabia um, you know, that, that would have said, no, this could make us look really, really bad. Saudi Arabia has to present itself as a Muslim country. Saudi Arabia is the homeland of Wahhabism, right? And and so, yeah, that's ridiculous. The reason that he didn't and the Democrats didn't was because they didn't want to give Trump any credit for anything that he had attained in his administration. And I think all of that is appalling. And, you know, I see this story of Muslim against Jew being put forward in this propagandistic manner. And I think, well, the Muslim world has to make a choice too, because it doesn't look to me. Muslim against Jew. What I see is Jew against Muslim, right? Um, I'm sorry, but it's like I live in New York City and I have been in New York City for well over a decade. I've been here for 15 years. And do you know how many conversations I've had with people that go, well, you know, I actually read the Quran. OK, I know what Muslims are. I mean, you know, I mean, no, I mean, the idea that Islam is an evil terrorist conspiracy, that there is no Sunni, there is no Shia. They're all part of a big conspiracy together and they're all the same as Hitler. And you know how much anti-Islamic bigotry there is from the uh, the the Zionist community. Since 9-11, they have been trying to trigger people and draw them into an anti-Islamic hysteria. Meanwhile, at Palestine rallies everywhere, they go out of their way. They bend over backwards to highlight the voices of anti-Zionist Jews to say we're not against Jews. We're against Zionism. We're against Israel. Uh, you know, I mean, they the Palestinians bend over backwards to not make this about the Jews and the Zionists constantly make this about the Muslims. Right. Islam is an evil religion. Islam's are terrorists. They get pastors that burn Korans. You know, they I, I mean, you know, they had a and the NYPD had an anti-Islamic training film that they were showing called The Last Jihad that was part of this Zionist hate. There's all I mean, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous for him to say, oh, well, the, the Muslims are just trying to demonize the Jews. No, the, the Muslims go to any Palestine rally. They bend over backwards to not even use the word Jew, whereas Zionists hate Islam. And, and they constantly talk about Islam being a terrorist religion, Muslims being barbarians, Muslims being inferior. Muslims are all in a big conspiracy against them. So that, what he just said there, I'm sorry, anyone who's attended, I have attended both rallies to cover them for the news. And what he's saying there is bullshit. Their proper champions are, is the government in Iran, you know, and, 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 and it's not like the Saudis. Yeah, yeah, it is the government in Iran that is their proper cha champions. And the government of Iran also supported the IRA. There's a street in Iran named after Bobby Sands, the great martyr of the Irish Republican Army. Did you know that? The Iranians also supported Nelson Mandela and the struggle for freedom in South Africa. The USA supports a dictator in Bahrain that is imposed on the population. And Iran supports the majority of the people of Bahrain that are Shia Muslims in protesting against that dictator and demanding free elections. Iran also supports Venezuela and Cuba. Iran supports many countries around the world that are struggling against U.S. imperialism. And 
their support for the Palestinians fits in with that. And you're like, oh, they want Iran to be their champion. Yeah, Iran has a long record of supporting people that are fighting against imperialism because the Islamic Republic was born in an anti-colonial, anti-imperialist revolution. That's why, right? And I mean, what, 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 oh, Iran bad. Like, you know, I mean, again, he's appealing to people that have just seen hate about Iran on TV. And he thinks that's an own, like, oh, Iran supports you. Yeah, Iran also supported supported uh, the Nation of Islam and the Black Freedom Movement. Iran also supported Nelson Mandela. Iran supported the IRA, right? Um, so he doesn't know what he's talking about that. Flaws and perhaps the rest of the Arab governmental structures, but the, the Islam world should move in the direction of the Abraham Accords. Oh, that boy, Abraham Accords. There he goes again. He's just saying Abraham For everyone. Accords. We could Abraham have a real Accords. peace. We could have something approximating a union of the Abrahamic people. And I think the accord was named extraordinarily well. Or we could have what we've had for the last 75 years with the Palestinians as perpetual cannon fodder, you know, at the beck and call of those for whom having them be cannon fodder is useful. And right, now Israel has been expanding into Palestinian territory with settlements constantly. The Palestinians have been living under occupation. Right. Uh, and the Israelis won't let them have their own state. The Israelis won't let them. I, I mean, this is ridiculous. Oh, well, you know, they're just cannon fought. Like, no, they're in their homeland living under occupation. So, yeah, well, there's just moral quandaries everywhere there. It's a minefield. But that's what I think is the, the fundamental reality of the current situation. It's a propaganda war. And there's a lot at stake. On October the 7th, Hamas obviously committed a, a terror attack of appalling magnitude. Where were you? Not compared to what Israel has been doing for the last 75 years, right? I mean, I don't know. What was the death count on, on uh, October 7th? I mean, it was 1,200. We find out that many of those people were not civilians. Many of them were actually killed by the Israeli military that killed its own people. Uh, there were no beheaded babies. But even if you take those numbers on surface value, 1,200 Israeli lives compared to 30,000 Palestinian lives. You know, it's like a 30 to one, you know, and and oh, I mean, the whole country of Palestine has been forced out with the Nakba occupations, crimes. I mean, give me a break. You when you first heard about it and what was your instant feeling about it? Why would you ask him that? What was your feeling about it? He's he he watched the same right wing propaganda that other people watched, right? And so he's going to say, "Oh, well, I I was triggered by the oh, horrible things that the Palestinians did. I I hate those Palestinians. Oh boy, geez, you know they're almost as bad as Stalin, and uh, they're almost as bad as 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 Kim Il Sung, who's the same as the woke people. He golly, that's how I felt. Like we, of course, we know how you felt. Well, my instant feeling was to be sickened by it. See, told ya. You know, and it hasn't been that long since I was in Jerusalem. And so it was a little closer to me than it might have otherwise been. Um, I'm also more sensitive to any signs of anti-Semitic catastrophe from studying the Holocaust for the length of time that I did. And I've always regarded Jews as the canary in the coal mine. And I think the reason that the Jews are the canary in the coal mine is because they're a successful minority. You know, and if a, if a culture can tolerate a successful minority, it's pretty damn robust and it's not very resentful. And as soon as a culture starts to get resentful, the Jews make an easy target because they're a minority. And so well, that's an easy target to begin with. But then they're the minority that has the temerity to be successful. And that really brings the resentful out of the rat holes. Isn't that interesting how like, so he can say something that if I said it would be anti-Semitic. If I were to say the Jews are a minority that has done exceptionally well in in business, that is overrepresented in Congress, if I said things like that, I would be called anti-Semitic. And so I don't say things like that. Right. I don't I don't try to make it about that. But he's on there as a Zionist, as a supporter of Israel, talking about how successful the Jews are. Right. He's saying exactly what anti-Semites say about overrepresentation of Jews in high places. He just thinks it's a good thing. Right. Um, you know, that's basically. So as long as you think that American imperialism is great, 
and 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 Israel is great, pointing out that Jews are way overrepresented in the American government or in American business or in American entertainment. That's totally fine as long as you're on the side of the imperialists. Keep note of that. If you're anti-imperialist and you suddenly start pointing out that certain groups are overrepresented, then they run at you with anti-Semitism. But he's on there saying exactly what people that are accused of anti-Semitism say, right? And it's okay to say it as long as you're pro, as long as you're in favor of this system, right? And I've seen a rise in anti-Semitism online over the last three years. It's just stunning to behold on the right and on the left, but jointly. And then, well, so I was sickened by it, but then I was also immediately suspicious of Iran's role. And I mean, that doesn't require any particular perspicacity on my part. I think it's... Yeah, you just listen to right-wing media and they demonize Iran. And Saudi Arabia is a partial owner of the Wall Street Journal. It's quite obvious, but but I that also opens up the, the rat's nest of, of the maneuvering, the political maneuvering around the Abraham Accords, because... Oh, he said Abraham Accords again. You no, know, I was very ill when the Abraham Accords were signed and I couldn't or hadn't paid much... How long has Donald Trump not been in office? We're about to have yet another election. It's been four years since this Abraham Accords bullshit. But that's all he can talk about because he's just a Trump surrogate at this point. This guy's supposed to be so smart. He's just a Trump surrogate. What did Trump do? Oh, Abraham Accords. And he just like he just Abraham Accords, Abraham Accords, Abraham Accords. Attention. And when I sort of recovered my ability to see again, I saw that this remarkable peace process had taken place. And I could not understand for the life of me why it wasn't trumpeted on the front page of every newspaper across the world. And I also think that Trump's team should have got a Nobel Peace Prize for it. I, I cannot see how you could possibly make a counter argument to that for all of Trump's flaws and for his administration's flaws. This well, I think a pretty strong counter argument to that deserving of Nobel Peace Prize would be what's happening right now. I think what's happening right now pretty well shows that the Abraham Accords were not going to bring everlasting peace in the Middle East. Um, I think if you look at the situation right now, the idea that we were going to have peace uh, because of the Abraham Accords has been pretty well debunked. This was a major accomplishment. And yet it's just shilling for Trump about these Abraham Accords. He doesn't even really have any knowledge of this situation or argument. And I know the Saudis were behind it. You know, they didn't sign it, but it wouldn't have gone forward without their nod and wink. And I know, I believe that if Biden would have taken the opportunity and be He's repeating himself, he said this already in a bit magnificent doesn't know anything about this. They just gave him talking points before the fucking interview. Animus in his response to Trump, which he could have been, instead of thinking of him as Satan himself, that he could have enticed the Saudis into a peace accord. And we wouldn't be in this damn situation now. And now we're playing it out the hard way, you know, because the Iranians could win the propaganda war and they've got, God only knows how many agents they have in the West, you know, promoting the kind of social upheaval that we've seen on the streets in the last few weeks. And so the narrative could go either way, but I'm rooting hard for the, for the Abraham Accord signees. Good. And I hope they have yeah. the courage of their convictions. And I hope they can see that their way forward dumb. is the most appropriate way forward for the good of the Muslim world. I'm getting dumber listening to this. Or what, are we gonna stay in some 14th century conflict between the fundamentalist Muslim world and the, and the Jews, Jesus, that sounds, you know, we've had enough of that, haven't we? You'd think. Right, I mean, I it, could, it couldn't Shapiro. be about like people actually being oppressed or what Israel actually does. It's just, it's just 14th century bigotry. And you notice how he makes it about the Jews, right? Which again, those of us that are anti-Israel bend over backwards to not make it about the Jews because we don't want to be promoting ethnic bigotry and we don't want to be anti-Semitic. But the people that defend Israel always make it about the Jews, right? I mean, if we got up and we said that Israel did something and we said the Jews did this, they would accuse us of anti-Semitism. But he gets up and he says, oh, it's a fight between the Muslims and the Jews. And that's totally fine, right? It's OK to be anti-Semitic as long as you support Israel, right? I mean, you know, I mean, that's what I'm getting from this, right? He makes it about the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. What about all the Jews who don't support Israel? Right. Notice how the Palestinian movement constantly tries to make it not about the Jews, but but the Zionists do make it about the Jews. Um, you know, I mean, that tells you everything you need to know right there. That really tells you everything you need to know. Um, I'm looking for something else to react to uh, regarding this, um, you know, uh, because this this interview is getting a little bit dull.
to tell you the truth. Um, I'm looking for a Ben Shapiro video about Iran, perhaps, um, you know, um, maybe something, something that I can, I can react to. This is getting boring. This Jordan Peterson one, he has one talking point. So, you know, there you go. There you go. Um, yeah, I'm looking for something, something I can react to. If anyone in the chat has anything that they recommend, um, you know, that would be good. Um, yeah, this is a wild night, folks. Um, I do have a number of super chats to respond to, and we will we will get to that at some point. Um, you know, and I do appreciate that. Um, I think I'm going to be on for quite some time. I'm a little tired, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, it's spring. I got those spring allergies. But this is, I mean, this is the big. This is a very big day. I mean, Iran and Israel are going head to head. Uh, so. This is, you know, this, I, I hope this isn't World War III, but it, it very, very well could be. Um, and this is, this is a scary time, to tell you the truth. This is a, a frightening, frightening time uh, right now. Um, you know, uh, this is, I mean, things could get real very, very, very quickly. Um, you know, and I, I worry about that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that, which anyone in this situation would be concerned, right? Um I mean, this is a very, very serious situation. So I'm, I'm looking for other material to react to, um, you know, other developments. Um, you know, the UN, Antonio Gu uh, Gutierrez has condemned Iran's response to Israel. Um, oh, wow. Well, here's something. Um, we'll put this on. This is fascinating. So now there's now a video. I'll, I'll show you the video. This is video that has just surfaced. We'll put We'll put this on. This is a big deal. Hold on. Um, so one landmark that has been a very big part of the conflict uh, in Gaza and elsewhere uh, has been the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. That is the big mosque uh, that uh, that is, you know, in Jerusalem. It, 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 Jerusalem is called Al-Quds uh, by Muslims, and it's a very holy city. Um, a lot of important things in the history of Islam happened in Jerusalem. Um, and um, I guess uh, Iranian drones have been seen flying over the Al-Aqsa uh, Mosque. Uh, you know, that's that's big. Uh, I'm going to put that on the screen. Um, this is video of the Iranian drones flying over the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In Yeah, look at that, folks. Look at that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's intense. But what else? What else do we have? Um Oh, wow. Yeah. Israeli targets have been hit. Uh, the Negev Desert, the Negev region, uh, that's where there's a lot of Israeli settlements. Uh, the Negev region, apparently we've got footage now of drones in the Negev region hitting their targets. Uh, Iranian drones are are hitting their targets. Let's put that on. Wow, this is, this is wild. There, there's Iranian drones connecting. It's happening. Uh, yeah, is Israel is getting hit. Israel is getting hit. Um, you know, this is this is footage that's been released by the Tasnim Tasnim News Agency of Iran. Uh, from yeah, this is Iranian drones connecting. Yeah, that's for real, folks. Yeah. They said, oh, none of them are going to get through. No, Israel's got their Iron Dome. It'll never get through. No one can get through that. That looks to me like they got through. I don't see any Iron Dome deflecting these. Whoa. There we go, folks. There we go. There we go. If only these bombs were hitting Syria or hitting Iraq, American media would be cheering as they fall and talking about how sexy and beautiful the missiles were like they were when Trump bombed Syria. But no, uh, American media is decrying this uh, as, yeah, this is wild. 
Oh, and we have a tweet from the White House. Oh, gotta love this. This is an actual tweet from the President of the United States. Oh, gotta love this one. I don't even, I mean, this is so dumb. This is like, this is so dumb. This is the White House. This is what they're doing. Biden's not addressing the country, but this is what he's doing. I just met with my national security team for an update on Iran's attack against Israel. Our commitment to Israel's security against threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. So he posed for a picture. He posed for a picture in a meeting room uh, with his staff. Look at that. Biden is on top of this. You know, I wonder how many versions of this picture they took to get Biden's facial expression right, to get Anthony Blinken in the picture. Oh, goodness gracious. This is just so silly. This is utter silliness. This is America's leadership right here. This is they're leading the country right now. They posed for a picture and tweeted out a picture uh, of, of, yeah, this is, this is classic. That's America. He's leading the country. That's our fearless leader, Joe Biden. He is sitting in a room and he took a selfie. They, they took a picture of him sitting in a room with Anthony Blinken. Yeah, there we go. There we go. All righty. What else? What else do we got? What else is happening? I'm just trying to stay on top of all of this. Um, yeah, Israel's claiming this is a, a violation of the UN Char. Oh, yeah, Iranian missiles hitting other targets in Israel. Uh, they're connecting. You know, they said that Iron Dome was ironclad. Uh, it was not ironclad. I mean, yeah. And this is, you know, we're not happy about this. We're not happy to see any loss of life. Um, but Israel's been bombarding Gaza for months and months and months, and they attacked Iran. And you know, wow, you know, um, this is this is intense. Um, it's happening. You know, the Israeli government said it could just it could always protect people, um, but they have gotten through Israeli defenses. That's pretty clear. Um, you know, take a look at this. Here we go. This is happening as we speak. Yeah. Doesn't look like that Iron Dome is helping them. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it sure sucks to be on the other end of it, doesn't it? You know, I don't know if you guys know, but the Israeli settlers, when they're going to bomb a Palestinian uh, area, they sit on their roofs with deck chairs. It's like a show and they like applaud and celebrate it while, while they watch the Palestinians get bombed. I don't know if you guys know that, but that's that's what they do. Um, you know, they, they routinely do that. Um, and they'll even they even think it's funny. They'll tell the Palestinians, oh, you know, uh, we're going to bomb right here. So you have 30 seconds to run. And then they all start running and then they bomb the place that they run to. And they all laugh about it and they think it's funny. You should read about what the Zionist settlers do. So uh, now I guess they're getting hit with bombs. And I wonder if they think it's so funny now. I wonder if they think it's so hilarious now. Right. You know, um, there you go. There you go. You know, you don't want to be spiteful. You don't want to be vengeful. But the amount of vile hate that you hear from the mouths of Zionists. I mean, they really do think Arabs are subhuman. They really do think that any criticism of Israel is just, you know, is just propaganda. That Israel's never done anything wrong, never killed a single innocent civilian. Uh, and, you know, they think that, I mean, and yeah, I mean, this is, this is Jerusalem. Wow. Uh, I'm about to show you a footage. I mean, this is, I'm looking at this footage that's coming out, folks. This is, they have gotten through the Iron Dome. Uh, that's that's pretty clear. That Iron Dome is not so iron. Um, you know, wow. So here, I'll, I'll just show you. This is this is over Jerusalem, right? This is over Jerusalem. Uh, this is footage. This is actual footage. This is Israelis are filming this with their phones, and it's happening. It's it's happening right now. It's happening. Um, look at this. That's the sky over Jerusalem right now. Wow, 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 wow. Wow. 
you know, and you know, the funny thing is, did did Bibi Netanyahu not think that Iran was going to respond to this? I mean, he was trying as hard as he could um, to to provoke an Iranian response, and he got it right. And then when a lot of um, when a lot of Israelis get hurt or killed, uh, he's going to say, "Oh my God, look how evil Iran is! You provoked this, right? Iran tried their hardest not to respond to you, and you you wanted this to happen." Uh, you know, I mean, if Israel had just stuck to bombing Gaza, even this probably wouldn't have happened. But they had to just try and provoke a regional conflict. Um, you know, uh, this is yeah, um, this is this is extensive. This is this is big. This is big. Um, so we've got condemnations coming in from various governments in the world. Um, Biden will not be addressing the nation. This is, this is wild. This is, yeah, this is a big moment. This is a very, very, very big moment. Um, you know, I saw that my friend Danny Shaw, uh, who's a really good guy, doesn't agree with me on everything, but he's from a generally similar approach. He's an anti-imperialist, but he doesn't agree necessarily with everything that I say. Um, but I saw that he got fired from his job as a college professor here in New York because he opposes Israel. Um, and that is unbelievable, right? Um, they fired him from his job. And there's been a number of professors uh, that they have fired for their opposition to Israeli crimes. And that is uh, that is absolutely disgusting. Um, you know, um, so, you know, I, I am very, very opposed to that. Um, oh, OK. So somebody, a fan uh, just sent. Uh, and thank you, uh, whoever you are, just sent me some anti-Iran propaganda to react to. Um so, um, yeah, this is uh, uh, Gonza Garcia. So they, they sent it to my email. Thank you. Um, this is an anti-Iran video called Iran Plans World War III. Um, right. You know, not U.S. imperialism, not the Zionists. You know, it's all Iran's fault. So we're going we're gonna to respond to Iran Plans World War III. Uh, we'll respond to that since we're responding to anti-Iran propaganda. Right. And thanks everybody for sticking around tonight. Um, you know, I plan to be streaming quite a bit tonight. Uh, we are about, we are way past the two hour mark, um, but I'm going to keep going because this is very, very important. Um, you know, um, so yeah, uh, but we'll respond to that. Um, I do need to take a little bit of a break at some point. So I'll probably put some music or some videos on, uh, but I'm going to keep going as long as I can. This is gonna, a night that's going to go down in history. The night Iran struck back. Um, and I want to be here with all of you as history unfolds here. Um, this is very, very big. So thanks for being here. Um, I think when I come back, we'll go through the super chats because super chats are very important. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm going to re react to this anti-Iran video. Um, and uh, and then from there, uh, we will uh, take a little bit of a break. Then I'll answer more super chats and we'll just keep going. Right. I want to keep going as long as we can tonight. I want to keep this channel, this channel going um, because, you know, a lot is happening and, um, you know, we'll we'll like to be here for you. So. All right. So here's an anti Iran video that we can react to called Iran plans World War Three. A lingering enmity between Iran and the United States is one of the likeliest hotspots to spark a third global war. While Iran doesn't enjoy the type of full-fledged support from allies that other nations wrapped up in both previous world wars did, a confrontation in the Middle East comes with the threat of rapidly becoming hugely destabilizing, and multiple major powers all have a vested interest in how said conflict turns out. Some may even be willing to go to war against the obvious top dog in this matchup, the United States of America. Iran's been a particularly spicy boy since the 1979 Iranian Revolution, where Ayatollah Khomeini overthrew a Western-backed dictator. In some ways, it's hard to blame the new Iran's attitude. The old Shah had concentrated Iran's oil wealth amongst the elite, creating a massive wealth gap. He also invited Western specialists into the country to help extract the oil and build the necessary infrastructure. His accommodations for these Westerners ended up violating many fundamentalist Islamic rules. And they also ended up making the people of the country very, very poor. Uh, they also tortured thousands and thousands of people. Like, it's a little bit more than just breaking some Islamic rules. The decadent events such as the 1971 celebration of the 2500 years of the Persian Empire threw fuel onto the fire. 
As inflation rocked the nation, austerity measures that disproportionately affected the lower classes drove many toward revolutionary circles. After the revolution, Iran experienced what many would consider an overcorrection toward fundamentalism. Today, the nation finds itself at a crossroads. Wait, you know, they also industrialized the whole country with a construction jihad and built huge power plants and built huge highways all throughout the country. They brought electricity to the whole country. They brought telephone service to the whole country. Uh, they wiped out illiteracy in the country. They wiped out unemployment in the country. There is no unemployment in Iran. I don't know if you know this, but in Iran, you're guaranteed employment by the state. If you don't have a job, there's a place you can go and the government will give you a job like automatically. It's not a good job, but they just give people jobs. I mean, yeah, the Islamic Revolution of Iran basically raised all kinds of people up out of poverty, eradicated unemployment, eradicated illiteracy, paved huge highways in the country, electrified the country. But none of that's worth pointing out, right? Meanwhile, the people of Yemen, uh, you know, have been living under the domination of U.S. imperialism, and, and it's one of the poorest countries in the, in the world. Uh, you know, the Islamic Revolution has had huge economic gains for the, the Iranian people. No need to mention that, though. As the newer generation bear little of their father's hostility for the West and instead grow increasingly tired of the oppressive rule of the fundamentalist state. Uh, that might have been true before, but then Iran signed a nuclear deal with the United States. A lot of these younger people voted for Rouhani because he said he was going to make get along with America. And Iran signed a nuclear deal and America responded to that nuclear deal by murdering the top Iranian general and putting in more sanctions and wrecking their economy. So now I think a lot of young Iranians that maybe at first were taken in by the idea that America is a happy, happy fun land full of iPods and whatever, now actually hate and are angry at the United States as well. And as we just spoke with one of them, a young university student, Madonna, they don't hate American people. They hate the American government that works for Israel, that works for the global financial system. It works for imperialism. And it doesn't work for the American people. They love the American people. They hate the U.S. regime and they hate the global financial system. But yeah, any, any that, that, that idea that young Iranians were becoming westernized and, and, and that's, that's about 10 years old, right? Yes, at one point, Iranian youth were moving in that direction. And then the Rouhani administration and the Iran nuclear deal flopped. Uh, and then Qasem Soleimani got murdered. And now the Iranian youth uh, are, realize that America is not going to going to make things better for the Iranian people. In turn, blames the U.S. and its allies for sowing the seeds of discord. The biggest point of contention. Right, right. right. There's, there's no you know, there's no color revolution apparatus. Right. It's not like the Mujahideen Kalk terrorists that bombed the Iranian parliament are, are living in the United States. It's not like the old Shah, the dictator of Iran that killed all those people lives in Sunset Park in Los Angeles, right, in luxury and has like reality TV shows made about it. No, no, no. You know, Iran just blames America for the unrest in the country. It's not like there's hundreds of Persian language TV stations broadcast through satellite television from the United States trying to incite the Iranian people against their government. I mean, how, oh, you know, there's no, there's no, no attempt to destabilize Iran, no attempt to create unrest in Iran. The U.S. government has spent literally billions and billions of dollars trying to incite Iranians to rise up and overthrow the Islamic Republic, and they haven't done it, right? Uh, so, yeah, that, that's ridiculous. Iran blames America. That's crazy. America would never, like, try to destabilize Iran. I mean, god damn, right? I mean, it's been revealed that uh, Jared Andrew Cohen, of the Hillary Clinton State Department was going to Twitter and telling Twitter how to manipulate Twitter in order to, you know, prevent, uh, to create unrest in Iran. And Obama tried to fire him for it because he was doing it without Obama's permission. And I mean, that was revealed by New Yorker magazine. I've talked about that many times. The USA is actively trying to destabilize Iran. If you look at what Iraq is right now, how the USA destroyed Iraq and now there's instability. If you look at Afghanistan, that's what the United States wants to bring to Iran. It doesn't like strong nations that are industrializing and raising their people out of poverty. It wants chaos and instability so they can stay at the top. And that's what they want to bring to Iran. The U.S. and Iran is its pursuit of nuclear weapons, something that the U.S. has made clear in no uncertain terms it will not tolerate. Yeah, Iran has signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, and every site in Iran uh, that has nuclear power is monitored 24 hours a day by the International Atomic Energy Agency. 
And Iran has never at any point been found in violation of the non-proliferation treaty. Their pursuit of nuclear weapons does not exist. And if it did, they would be condemned by the International Atomic Energy Agency. But Iran, Iran, not only have they not pursued nuclear weapons, they have never once been found in violation. Not once have they ever been found in violation of the, of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. But on top of that, they made a deal with Obama and gave up almost all their nuclear power plants. So they're not seeking nuclear weapons. That's ridiculous. 1957, Iran began to pursue a nuclear weapons program, but found little success. In 1957, when the USA was backing up their military dictatorship, right? That's like a ridiculous distortion, right? Yeah, the USA actually was helping Iran try to get nuclear weapons back in 1957. Like this is, that's after the, that's right after the USA toppled the democratic government of Iran in 53 and brought the Shah back into power, right? So right there, they're trying to make it sound like the current government of Iran that didn't come to power until 1979 was trying to get nukes in 1957. They're lying to you. Faced with an existential crisis in its war with neighboring Iraq in 1980, Iran decided that pursuing nuclear weapons was a matter of national survival. No, they didn't. The Supreme Leader of Iran condemned all nuclear weapons research. Uh, the, the Khomeini and Khamenei have always said that Islam forbids the use of nuclear weapons. This is just a lie. These are lies. China and Russia were all too happy to assist Iran in developing what they termed peaceful development of nuclear power. And that's also what the International Atomic Energy Agency terms it, because they've not found Iran in violation of the nuclear treaty a single time. Not one time has Iran ever been found in violation of the IAEA. What they call, that's what, what, that's what all the experts call it. That, I mean, this is ridiculous. However, all involved knew that the cooperation on nuclear development programs was easily re-engineered toward the development of nuclear weapons themselves. Look at that. You know, they got the maniacal face. <laughs> and Russia and China are supposedly in on it, too. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? This is utterly ridiculous, right? Uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, it, the, all involved is the International Atomic Energy Agency that monitors every site. And so if they don't think it's that, I don't I mean, I don't even know what to say here. In the early 2000s, the U.S. warned that Iran was reaching completion of the development of a functional nuclear weapon. Yeah. under. Yeah. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And that was that was over 20 years ago. Incredible scrutiny and international pressure. Iran at last agreed to terminate its nuclear weapons program in 2003. That's they never had a nuclear weapons program, though maintained that its centrifuges would remain and be only used to enrich uranium for use in civilian nuclear reactors, which they have the right to do under the treaty. They have the right to have peaceful nuclear energy. However, an International Atomic Energy Agency investigation revealed that Iran had secretly continued to pursue a nuclear weapons program, no. prompting the U.S. No, it did not reveal that. That is not accurate. It did not. It did not. It did not. And Iran has turned over and disclosed every site. They're in full compliance. West, China, France, Germany, Russia, and the U.K. to put pressure on the country to cease its weapons program once and for all. In 2006, the UN Security Council agreed on a package of sanctions meant to punish Iran for its pursuit of nuclear weapons and encourage it to give up going down that path. This resulted in an immediate 20% rate of unemployment and significant loss of GDP. The economic pain was severe, and the Iranian people were growing increasingly unhappy. But Iran refused to give up its nuclear weapons program. This is just a lie. There was never an Iranian nuclear weapons program. With Hassan Rouhani elected in 2013, the U.S. and Iran held a series of bilateral talks over the subsequent years, finally ending in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in 2015. This agreement was aimed firmly at preventing Iran from getting weapons and came with key provisions. Iran would reduce its... Yeah, and in that treaty, the USA admitted that Iran had the right to peaceful nuclear energy. And in exchange for that, Iran got rid of almost all of its peaceful nuclear energy power plants. Stockpile of enriched uranium by 98% for 15 years, remove two-thirds of its enrichment centrifuges for 10 years, and allow International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors access to any facility they requested within 24 days for surprise inspections. They already did that. The IAEA already monitors every nuclear site. Of any country that has signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, every nuclear site they have has to be monitored. So they didn't agree to that in the, the international in, in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. That already existed. 
There are there are cameras monitoring all their nuclear sites 24 hours a day. That's just a lie. Upon Iran signing the agreement, the UN Security Council approved Resolution 2231, which officially opened up sanctions relief for Iran. On January 16, 2016, Iran received sanctions relief worth an estimated $100 billion. However, the JCPOA was not deemed suitable by incoming American President Donald J. Trump. Oh, it wasn't just that. Saudi Arabia then murdered uh, Ayatollah Namir al-Amir, uh, the leader of the is Islamic uh, Shia movement in Saudi Arabia. He beheaded him in retaliation for the Iran nuclear deal. Then, uh, then Sheikh Zakzaki in Nigeria was abducted by the Nigerian military. Then the U.S. Congress immediately put new sanctions on Iran simply because they have non-nuclear ballistic missiles. And, you know, I... I they there was a huge reaction to the nuclear treaty and and there was a huge effort to make iran suffer and attack iran in the aftermath of the signing of that deal so that's 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 not included he just skips ahead to trump with a cabinet full of hawks advising him to tear the agreement up and start over trump withdrew from the jcpoa in 2018. new sanctions were immediately reimposed on iran there were new sanctions that were put on Iran by the U.S. Congress immediately after the deal was signed. Didn't didn't come until didn't come from Trump. I reported on them. As the U.S. offered terms for a new agreement, while Iran declined and issued its own terms for remaining within the JCPOA. Yeah, the USA wanted a new agreement that was not what Iran agreed to, um, and the rest of the countries that signed the JCPOA stuck with it, but the USA pulled out. The USA was the only country that wasn't still in it. President Trump further demanded that European allies cease their trade with Iran in order to further isolate the nation, but they refused, opting instead for the... Yeah, because then the, the reason those countries refused was because then the nuclear deal would mean nothing. If you make a deal with a country, right? If you make a deal with a country, um, that would... Um, hold on, I gotta, gotta fix my background here. Right, if you make a deal with a country, that they don't get nuclear weapons, um, you know, in exchange for uh, for certain sanctions being lifted, and then you don't lift the sanctions on that country. Uh, what does your word mean at that point, right? So yes, the European powers did not want to pull out of the agreement and did not want to impose new sanctions and end their trade with Iran because then their word would mean nothing, and then no country is going to make a deal with the United States ever again rather than the stick. President Trump then promptly threatened unspecified consequences against the Europeans. The new sanctions on Iran have prompted the nation to move toward nuclear armament faster than ever. And if False! No! Iran is still a signatory of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. That, that's false! Emboldened hardliners within the country as the nation faces its worst economic crisis since the Iran-Iraq War. The nation has long supported extremist groups in the Middle East, but began to arm and train Shiite militants in force after the JCPOA agreement was terminated. No, there was no difference. Iran has aligned itself with Hezbollah since the 80s. Iran has aligned itself with the Houthis since, you know, 2003 at least. Uh, none of this is like Iran increased its support for... No, Iran has supported the Bahrain movement against the, uh, against the Saudi-backed king of Bahrain. Like, there was no change in Iranian foreign policy after after the uh, nuclear agreement. Uh, there, there was no change in Iranian foreign policy. Um, if anything, Iran put up with a lot because their top general, Qasem Soleimani, got murdered. Through its elite Quds force, Iran has provided high-tech drones to Hezbollah, trained and equipped over 100,000 Shiite fighters in Syria, supplied ballistic missiles and drones to Houthi fighters in... Whoa, 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 hold up. Those... those Shiite fighters in Syria are fighting ISIS. They're defending the secular Syrian government that allows Christians and Sunnis and Shias and, and Jews and others to live in peace together in Syria. This defending that government from ISIS. And it's there with the Syrian government's permission. So how is that promoting extremism? Right? The legit internationally recognized Syrian government that is once again a member of the Arab League, a UN member state, invites Iran to help them fight ISIS, and you call that funding extremism. What the hell is this? This is that, That's absolutely ridiculous. In Iraq, which neighbors Iran, the Shia Muslims are being terrorized by ISIS. So Iran gives weapons to the Shia community of Iraq to protect themselves from ISIS. You call that funding extremism. This is ridiculous. This is completely ridiculous. Yemen ...and help Shiite militants in Iraq to develop long-range missiles.
help Shiite militants in Iraq. You're talking about Shia Muslims who just had their big main mosque bombed by ISIS, who were fighting ISIS on the battlefield, who were teaming up with Iraqi communists and with Iraqi Christians to fight against ISIS. You're calling them extremist fighters. Their neighborhoods are being terrorized by ISIS and they need to protect themselves from being slaughtered. And so they get some weapons from Iran to do it. And now you're calling them terrorists. They're in their own country. Shia are the majority in Iraq. How are they extremists? This is ridiculous. The U.S. has named Iran the forefront sponsor of terrorism and estimates it spends over a billion dollars arming and training extremist forces every year. But these extremist forces are people in Bahrain who want free elections. They're, they're people in Iraq who don't want to die at the hands of ISIS. They're the legit internationally recognized Syrian government. They're not extremists. This is ridiculous. Between 140,000 and 185,000 Quds Force partner forces remain in Afghanistan, Gaza, Lebanon, Pakistan, Syria, and Yemen. And in Afghanistan, those forces cooperated with the United States, right? Those forces actually had joint operations with the United States during the early years of the Afghan war. Like, that's ridiculous. You call them extremist forces in Afghanistan. They're not fighting against the United States, and they cooperated with the U.S. Qasem Soleimani was in Afghanistan cooperating with the U.S. against the Taliban at one point. This is ridiculous, right? It just labels all these people extremists. It's like not telling you. It, it doesn't tell you any of the details of any of these conflicts. It points to Syria. It points to, you know, it points to Iraq. It points to Afghanistan. It points to Yemen. And it just makes you think that, oh, they're, they're backing Osama bin Laden's and all these countries. That's not what's happening. Yemen, giving Iran a significant proxy force to threaten Western interests with. Under President Joe Biden's first term, the U.S.'s top concerns with Iran include the continued development of ballistic missiles with ranges of up to 1,250 miles. These could be yeah, hurt. Yeah, and when Israel is killing your people in other countries with drones and missiles, don't you think you have to be able to deter their attack? When the USA invaded your neighbor, Iraq, and destroyed that country with drones and cruise missiles, don't you think they ought to be able to deter their attack? I mean, it's like any country in Iran's situation is going to develop missiles to be able to repel an attack. Hurriedly loaded with nuclear warheads or biological or chemical agents, Iran is also... Oh, what the heck? Biological and chemical agents. So, so... We've gone from a country that, that has seen its neighbors attacked with American and Israeli cruise missiles, developing its own ballistic and cruise missiles, to trying to tell us they're planning some kind of biological attack. That is, Iran has been the victim of the use of, of, of chemical and biological weapons. The USA supplied Saddam Hussein with chemical and biological weapons, which he used on Iran. Iran are the victims of chemical and biological attacks from the United States and Israel. This is ridiculous. Could be hurriedly loaded with nuclear warheads or biological or- Right, you know, I mean, geez, I, you know, I, if I had a gun, right, I could use that gun to kill an innocent child, but I don't. This is ridiculous, right? Uh, 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 they have a ballistic missile. I mean, it could be loaded with it, you know? Geez, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I have a car. I could load it with explosives, but I don't. Like, that's ridiculous. That's not even, that's a non sequitur. Chemical agents. Iran is also selling armed drones to Russia in support of its war with Ukraine. Good, good, right. And Russia has every right to intervene in Ukraine to protect the people of the Eastern region. The people of Donetsk and Lugansk have been droned for eight years straight at the hands of the U.S.-backed Nazi regime. And Russia is Iran's friend. If America can sell weapons to Ukraine or give weapons to Ukraine, why can't Iran give weapons to Russia? Along with sales to militants in Iraq, Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, and Yemen. Right. People in Iraq that are trying to defend their communities from ISIS. People in Syria that are trying to defend their neighborhoods and communities from ISIS. Like, like oh my God, Iran is selling weapons. Like, what country sells more weapons to any uh, to, to around? I mean, I could make a video like this about the United States. And if I had a little red thing see on Iran. after every place that America sells weapons to, the whole globe would have red little dots on it. This is ridiculous. Iran sells weapons to people. God forbid a country do that. It's not like America has ever sold weapons to anybody, especially not like Mexican drug cartels or or Osama bin Laden or oh give me a break. I mean I mean Saudi Arabia was bombing Yemen 
for years and years on end with America supplying the weapons to do that. This is, oh, but Iran sells weapons. Be afraid of Iran. Oh, my God. ...has seized multiple U.S. drones and regularly harasses U.S. vessels while the nation launches cyber attacks against the U.S. and its interests. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's think about this. Now, they say they uh, the, the Iran regularly harasses U.S. vessels. Now, what is the ocean next to Iran called? It's called the Persian Gulf right? The Persian Gulf. So the USA has ships in the Persian Gulf and Iran, you know, goes close to them or something. You do realize, I mean, this is like that whole map, that meme that people make about how Iran puts its country right next to all of America's military bases. Retaliation for President Trump's 2020 assassination of Quds Force Commander General Qasem Soleimani. Iran has all Right. They just passingly mentioned that, that like the top military hero and leader of Iran gets killed by the United States in a cowardly move. He's going to peace talks in Iraq and on his way to the airport, the U.S. blows up his car with a drone in the most cowardly assassination ever. Um, and they just kind of passingly mention that because they're trying to make the case that Iran is somehow the aggressor in their own region in their own oceans. I mean, this is ridiculous. So hatched multiple plots to kill both current and former U.S. officials, though it's never proven. That's ridiculous. It's unknown if it's acted on any of them. It's unknown if it's acted on any of them. Yeah, well, military agencies run scenarios and, and different things all the time. The USA has, you know, war games and plans to invade various countries. It's unknown if it acted on any of them. So that's a bullshit non sequitur that has no place in this conversation. President Biden has attempted to restart talks over the nuclear deal abandoned by Trump, but both sides have yet to come to an agreement. No, not really, because Anthony, Anthony Blinken and John Bolton and the neocons that are backing Biden and that he needs their support against Trump, that they're not going to allow that. There hasn't been any serious effort for, to reopen negotiations. Now it's believed that thanks to the U.S. leaving the deal, Iran's accelerated work on developing nuclear weapons means it could be able to assemble one within a year or two. No, it doesn't. They have not broken the nuclear non-proliferation treaty at all. According to Israeli estimates, Iran has enough. According to Israeli estimates, you know, in the 80s, they claimed Iran was about to get a nuclear bomb. Israel's been claiming Iran is, is like months away from a nuclear bomb for decades. But Israel said it. It must be true. It must be true. Israel said it. Enriched uranium for at least four bombs in response. Yeah, except they use them for their peaceful nuclear energy sites that are monitored 24 hours a day by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And they got rid of almost all of those nuclear energy sites and the nuclear deal with the United States. As to the nuclear and asymmetrical threat posed by Iran, the U.S. and Israel have dramatically stepped up their military cooperation, engaging in a number of exercises together. Some of these have simulated flights of Israeli F-35s backed up by American F-15s penetrating deep into enemy airspace to carry out attacks highly insinuated to be attacks on Iranian nuclear facilities. The yeah, so, so now he admits that this whole time the USA is practicing the all-out destruction of Iran. It has Iran surrounded by military bases. It invades Iraq right next to Iran. It invades Afghanistan right next to Iran. It, invade, it attacks and destabilizes and occupies a big chunk of Syria right next to Iran. But somehow Iran is the aggressor. The U.S. has even deployed its strategic bomber force of B-52s and B-1s into the area on multiple occasions, signaling a willingness to retaliate against Iran with either overwhelming conventional power or possibly even nuclear power. In January 2023, the largest ever joint American and Israeli... Right, so earlier they told us that Iran maybe possibly talked about assassinating somebody. But now they're telling us that America and Israel have been plotting nuking Iran for decades, but somehow Iran is the aggressor, still. Early exercise involving 6,400 American troops and 1,500 Israeli troops was carried out, signaling a commitment to respond with immediate force to a nuclear Iran. The U.S. has made it abundantly clear it will not tolerate a nuclear Iran, and this resolve is mirrored by Israel, who is most directly threatened by Iranian nuclear weapons. However, a nuclear Iran could spark yeah. an arms race. Israel has hundreds of nuclear weapons. It's never signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Iran has never violated the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which they have indeed signed. I'm sorry, who is the aggressor? I mean, this is this is so ridiculous, right? Uh, Israel's threatened by 
by the bombs of, I mean, this is so ridiculous, just so utterly ridiculous. I mean, this is such a one-sided video. I mean, there's not any, any knowledge here. It's just make you scared of Iran, make you terrified of Iran, make you think Iran is out to get you. I mean, this is so, so ridiculously biased, so ridiculously biased. Um, but anyway, continue in the region, with states like Saudi Arabia and Jordan feeling the pressure to develop their own nuclear weapons to ensure their own safety versus a nuclear Iran. Yeah, yeah, that's not happening either, right? That's not happening either. None of those countries are developing nuclear weapons. Uh, that I mean, that it's just making things up now. And I, I mean, all of those countries have signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Everybody pretty much in the region has signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, except for Israel, which maintains stockpiles of hundreds of nuclear weapons um, and continues to get aid from the United States, which is a huge violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Israel hasn't signed the treaty. Israel does have nuclear weapons. It's the worst kept secret in history, I think some have called it. Um, and if anyone is in violation of that treaty, it's America that continues to fund Israel when Israel has a huge stockpile of nuclear weapons. All those countries in question have all signed the treaty and have been in full compliance with the treaty just like Iran has. This could spark a wave of proliferation that would be disastrous for the world in light of a near century of careful work to contain nuclear proliferation and thus limit the risk of a catastrophic nuclear exchange. There is little doubt then that the US is prepared to use the full might of its military against Iran to prevent this nightmare scenario. To just save the world from Iran's plots for nuclear. This is so ridiculous. But while Iran is significantly outmatched in every category, it isn't helpless. Iran's first move in a war against the West would be to block off the Strait of Hormuz. In fact, it's recently threatened to do just that in response to European lawmakers voting to label the Iranian Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organization. This would be catastrophic for the global energy trade as one yeah, well, you know, Israel bombing Gaza is catastrophic for tens of thousands of Palestinians. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, geez, you know, the USA bombing and murdering and killing prominent, prominent Iranian officials, that's a little bit dangerous. Yeah, I mean, you know. Fifth of all global oil flows through the strait, and Iran is well situated to enact a blockade. While at its narrowest point, the strait is 31 miles wide, the huge oil cargo ships that transit the strait are limited to a narrow channel through which they can pass. The real question then is, could Iran pull this off? Blocking the straits with... Well, I, you know, maybe they should, right? If the USA is going to go to war with Iran to defend Israel and defend Israel's right to murder, to heartlessly and cold calculatedly murder Iranian generals and, and Iran then can block off, you know, the world's oil supply, maybe that's what Iran should do under such circumstances. Here's a crazy idea. Maybe we should just say no to Israel. Maybe we shouldn't just give Israel everything it wants. Maybe we shouldn't protect Israel and allow it to keep murdering Palestinians. How about that? Like, you know, why is that idea just never floated? How about the USA just doesn't obey Israel and do whatever Israel wants? That would solve the problem in the Red Sea with the Houthis. That would solve the escalation with Iran going on. How about we just say no to Israel? Has that ever occurred to anybody? Just maybe not let Israel murder the Palestinians. It's a crazy idea. Oh, goodness. What, what happened there? All right. Okay. All right. Got to continue. It's simply too much for Iran's navy of seven frigates, three corvettes, 19 submarines, and 21 patrol vessels. Instead, Iran would rely on attacking merchant ships to blockade the strait physically. By sinking a massive oil tanker right at the strait's narrowest point, it could effectively blockade the strait for months, even longer if recovery efforts are undertaken under hostile fire. Modern tankers are certainly big enough for the job, but could Iran realistically sink one of the super tankers? Unlike during the 1980s tanker wars between Iran and Iraq, when both nations tried to sink each other's tankers, modern tankers are much larger and feature double hulls, which would be harder for even modern anti-ship missiles to do much fatal damage to. Then there's routine multinational escorts that patrol the waters, which Iran- Yeah, I think Iran can sink an oil tanker. I, I think it can be done. I. I, I would bet that, that Iran that's gotten through the Iron Dome just today, it's got all kinds of drones and, and, and missiles getting through the Iron Dome. I got a feeling they can probably sink an oil tanker or two. Uh, don't really think that'll be a problem. Iran would have to contend with if it wished to attack any civilian ship. 
As hostilities mount and put the US and Iran on a collision course for war, these multinational groups would add to their capabilities, becoming formidable challenges for Iran to overcome in any attack against merchant shipping. Thus, blockading the strait is not an impossible task, simply a very improbable one. I wouldn't count on that. I wouldn't count on that. Uh, if the Houthis can do it, I think the Iranians can do it. Though there is the question of if Iran would even do it, considering that over 70% of Asian oil transits the strait, and this move would immediately draw the deep ire of China. While China would love to see the US and Iran come to blows, or literally anyone willing to take on the US, it's not willing to see this happen at the cost of a significant amount of its own oil imports. The effect on the Chinese economy would be devastating, at a point where it's already entering a period of deep fragility and the Chinese might feel compelled to Oh yeah, yeah, just like Russia's economy crashed ever since the war began. I mean, they just couldn't handle it, right? I mean, the sanctions the USA put on Iran on Russia at the beginning of the war just destroyed Russia. Remember that? Oh yeah, it didn't. It Russia's economy is very strong. Yeah, this guy is like clearly so now he's like overestimating the strength of the United States. First, Iran was the crazy aggressor, and now Iran can't possibly do anything. Which one is it? Is Iran a weak country that couldn't possibly stop the sink an oil tanker? Or is Iran an aggressor that's about to launch World War III and nuke us all and we're going to die? You got to make up your mind, fellow. Which one is it? Is Iran weak and pathetic, or is Iran terrorizing the whole world? Actually lend military aid to their own to ensure trade continued to flow. Iran's most likely move then would be to use its proxy forces to attack US, European, and Israeli interests in the region, with nearly 200,000 militants supplied and trained by Iran. This very Yeah, and you know, hundreds of thousands of American troops in the region who have no business there that's on the other side of the planet far away from the United States, you know, I mean, veritable army of militants, it's one of Iran's biggest insurance policies as their reach expands across the entire region. Never one to shy away from terrorism, Iran's unleashing of these militant forces would inevitably lead to a dramatic uptick in terrorist attacks inside of Europe, with a lesser amount making it across the sea to the Oh my goodness. Uh, the terrorist attacks in Europe are carried out by ISIS, and ISIS is Iran's enemy, you lying sack of shit. The terrorist attacks that have happened, all the terrorist attacks in Europe that we've seen since the 90s, have been carried out by Wahhabis, by Al-Qaeda, by ISIS, have nothing to do with Iran. This is just a lie. US. This massive proxy force could throw the entire region into chaos, threatening global energy supplies. Name one terrorist attack that has happened since the 90s that had anything to do with Iran. That's just a lie. However, other nations might not be willing to see the US dominate Iran and overthrow its government to install a pro-Western replacement. China, for one, would hate to see US influence grow even stronger in the region. And while Russia has been relegated to the minor leagues, it too would be unhappy. Yeah, yeah Russia in the minor leagues, that's funny. They're kicking ass in Ukraine right now. Their economy survived an all-out economic attack from the United States at the beginning of the war. Yeah, minor leagues, I don't think so. Be about U.S. influence growing even stronger in the world's most economically important waterways. While extremely unlikely, a successful U.S. campaign to overthrow the current regime does run the risk of inviting action by these two nations. And yeah, Russia and China wouldn't tolerate the USA trying to overthrow Iran in support of Israel and allowing Israel to continue its bombardment of Gaza, which the whole world is demanding Israel stop. And could escalate the conflict into a full-out world war. Now go check out the... And whose fault would that be? Uh, that would be the fault of Israel and the United States. But all right. And now we have a guest from the Islamic Republic of Iran, Miss Madonna. Welcome. How are you? Hello, Mr. Mopin and everyone. Uh, yes. Could you hear my voice? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Um so yeah. you, you are studying at the university uh, in Iran, correct? You're studying uh, the uh, the sciences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, biology. Very good, biology. Very good. And um, I guess our our first question is going to be, you know, as someone living in the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, how do you feel about today's events? Um, and what are your concerns about the future, about what this could lead to? Uh, first, uh, in the name of Allah, and uh, tonight uh, is so very, very uh, 
pleasure and very happiness for all the people that uh, knows that Zionist regime uh, is uh, is the malicious and uh, malicious regime, uh, yeah. especially uh, yeah, uh, uh, Palis Palestinian and other people in the world that uh, they uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, time is so very. Um, soon in Iran, um, time is 2 uh, a.m. It's 2 a.m. in Iran. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, thank you <laughs> for being available at such a late hour. We really appreciate it. Um, You're welcome. So, and we, you know, we know that English is not your first language, and we appreciate you coming on and speaking to our audience. Um, you know, but you were saying that, that the Zionist regime is, is a malicious regime that has committed atrocities. And the, the feeling in Iran right now is a joyous one, you were saying. And tell us why people are joyous. Uh, one of the important things in this uh, action, uh, that means uh, about uh, Iran attack, uh, this is a reaction of this uh, happen, not action. Because, uh, and this important things that this is legitimate uh, legitimate defense legitimate defense mm -hmm. uh, after a long time uh, we uh, we had patience a lot uh, across that uh, Zionist regime uh, crossing uh, the red lines and uh, some, um, for example, uh, assassinations of nuclear scientists mm -hmm. and uh, supporting terrorist groups and uh, attacking uh, Iran's military and diplomatic positions uh, in different countries, including the recent case in uh, Damascus, Syria. Uh, okay, and after that, this is so... Uh, normally, and this is our right that uh, uh, we must respond uh, for finish these uh, crimes. And uh, this is one of the of uh, all punishments uh, punished that uh, Zionist regime. And inshallah, and if Allah wants that. Um, one day, one day in the soon, uh, we don't see any Zionist regime in the world. We won't be a Zionist regime in the world. And uh, I wanted, uh, I said um, in the past uh, time, uh, I remember that uh, I, uh, I said example, and that's biological example of this, that uh, COVID-1948 will be eradicated all the world uh, very soon. And this uh, happened for uh, today or tonight, uh, is the first step of this uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last part. This is the first step you were saying? Uh, the first step toward what? For eradicate Zionist regime. So this first the step toward the defeat of Israel. Ah, yeah, the eradication of the Zionist regime. And um, I understand that, you know, it's not just Iran that is striking Israel. Uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon is striking Israel. Uh, the Houthis are striking Israel. And uh, do you think that this is going to lead to Iran kind of mobilizing the Muslims of the entire world to just move in to defend the Palestinians? I mean, do you think this could be the beginning of a, of a full-scale war against Israel? Um, this is... Uh, that reality that uh, Iran is, uh, is a power full of uh, country and uh, other Islamic 
uh, countries uh, that means uh, has has a private uh, decisions and uh, they are uh, uh, separate country and nations sure. and uh, we never uh, want to uh, some uh, uh, God, sorry. <laughs> Mm, I forgot my words. Uh, that means uh, mm, uh, sorry, excuse me so much. No problem. Uh, I forgot my words. Yeah, just for my time is not very good. That's okay. Yeah, thanks for coming on so late at night. What? Uh -huh. um, we never want to interference uh, to other countries mm. and this is very clear but uh, muslim countries and uh, like yemen lebanon syria iraq uh, we have uh, common we have common uh, idea mm -hmm. about and about the Zionist regime that this demolishes those this regime uh, uh, must be uh, punished and uh, this is uh, action that's about this and uh, each country is uh, like a uh, like a puzzle, mm -hmm. countries like a puzzle complete these uh, events uh, for uh, free of uh, free uh, Palestine and uh, Palestinians. Uh, but uh, if we want to say that um, and this action about of Iran uh, of attack to uh, Israel uh, Zionist regime uh, areas and not just for uh, about uh, attack to uh, diplomatic position in uh, damage just not this uh, when we want to when we uh, search in the history uh, 75 years ago or more than, uh, Zionist regime uh, started uh, this uh, awful and uh, uh, bad uh, acting and uh, the oppressed acting um, from um, to uh, to Palestinians. Yeah, and. Uh, so um, this action of uh, tonight or uh, today, I don't know, your time is uh, and time is night or day, morning, yeah. And uh, but uh, we but in the six months ago, uh, from seven October until now. Uh, all the people in the world um, showed uh, uh, saw, saw that uh, these crimes and uh, they killed innocent people very mm -hmm. easily, very yes. easily, and uh, without any humanity. Right. And this is so. Uh, uh, this is so hard. Uh, break and uh, it's so very very uh, depressed uh, events and if you have if you are a human uh, actually actually uh, you sense this uh, tragedy and uh, sad and uh, 
we want to say that um, we never and um, we never uh, put uh, uh, sorry <laughs> uh, we never uh, put uh, excuse me so much uh, it's okay of what operation oh uh, uh, we don't yeah uh, we never uh, we never uh, allow to uh, punish uh, operation op uh, operation mm -hmm. uh, in in the world and this is the our duty our duty of humanity that we want we must to help and uh, the uh, Palestinians and others in the world that uh, need to help and um, other Muslims countries uh, uh, completed this uh, event. Yes, well, um, our member John McCarthy just sent a message. He said, your nation, Madonna, is an inspiration to the world, including the truly freedom-loving people of the United States. That's one of our members uh, gave that message to you. So, uh, and um, let me ask you, um, you know, what would you like to say to the people of the United States? What do you want them to know at this time? Mm -hmm. uh, American people, American people, I uh, always say that American people are separate from their nations. And they are, sorry, they are governments. That means uh, governments, uh, because Iran and the United States of America always uh, uh, in the challenge together. But uh, we have a problem just for governments. That's because the politics and, and this evil politics are very... Uh, uh, are very uh, normal. That means uh, we know that and we see, uh, for example, in uh, Palestine, Palestine uh, war, uh, okay, uh, America uh, equipments and to Zionist regime, okay. Um, this time is so important that you know uh, true and you know true and uh, you recognize the true and false together and separate mm -hmm. them and stop true and uh, where is true where is right or where is correct and uh, that's uh, which uh, which way is true and uh, um, it's not about um, our it's not about that uh, about religion or uh, nation or I don't know uh, others but this is just for humanity mm. and and it's so important that uh, we support uh, at this time we, we must support uh, rights and right is what Palestine and um, each country is that uh, uh, oppress to uh, oppression, we must to help that uh, uh, rescue and uh, defense of Palestinian, uh, especially at this time. And uh, uh, I want to say that. Please, please, uh, uh, please search a lot, not just for your uh, media. That because uh, we are in the media war, and uh, not just to your country. In my country, a lot, and uh, lies, um, news, and fake news are a lot, and especially propaganda yeah. uh, of time. Iran and these countries 
and just uh, search a lot in the net and in the uh, truth website, not just uh, each website, because uh, in at this time it's so important that you know you know uh, which way is true or false, and uh, the third uh, and the third one is that uh, please uh, uh, please read Quran. Okay. Uh, Quran as uh, your uh, documentary I I uh, I I watched and the before and uh, you showed in this slide uh, Mr. Karimi said about this uh, suggestion and now uh, I suggest to uh, you that you and uh, other youngers and teenagers of America uh, please read Quran just once not uh, to or I don't know but um, because you want to know, you want to know uh, which is correct, and uh, especially in this world, um, yeah. it's so hard that you recognize. Okay, you must do uh, search, and then you can uh, choose the best way. And uh, please read Quran, and don't uh, worry about that you're uh, safely because uh, uh, Iran have problem with uh, political of American not people. Yes. And Iran never start a war in, in the historic and you can search. Uh, but I all uh, what but we always respond uh, very uh, strictly and defend and but just this is a legitimate a legitimate defense not about yeah. that uh, so we are uh, yeah six. so before you go i just wanted to ask you i know that in iran um uh you know martyrs are held in very high regard um i wanted to ask you if you don't mind sharing and feel free to not share uh if you don't want to share but do you have any martyrs in your family in my family yes and uh, no no okay. no we okay. don't have but uh, i'm a director of documentary of martyrs oh wow okay yeah and uh, my documentaries uh, showed in tv cinema and uh, others oh wow where can can we watch it online is there a place we can watch your documentary Just personal language, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I can, I can um, translate, yeah, after that. Yes. Well, if you can send me the link, I'll share that with the audience. And then also, do you um, do you have any anyone you know who's in the military currently uh, in Iran that you are concerned about, you know, being in the, in the conflict? Excuse me, I can't uh, understand, please, again. Is there anyone you know who is in the military of Iran? Who is in the military in Iran? Yeah, anyone that you know, any any friend, any family member? No, no, uh, uh, like others. Okay, uh, very good. Okay. She seems to be frozen. Um, so I guess Madonna has frozen, but it was really, really great to have you, uh, Madonna. Uh, oh, there you are. Here you are. You're breaking up. You're Excuse starting me? to freeze. My net disconnected. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, General Qasem Soleimani is our um, as, is our hero and and the most zionist against. Yeah. Very good. Um, Very good. Here. Well, thank you, Miss Madonna. Uh, it looks like oh, your internet is yeah. breaking up, so we'll we'll cut this off here. But I do appreciate you coming on at such a late hour. I know it's two in the morning in Iran. 
And uh, we'll be waiting to hear back from you about updates. And we'll be all, the whole world is watching to see what happens next. So I want to thank you for your great contribution this evening. Um, and uh, so you know, for tell your... you the prayers of many Americans are with the people of Iran and with the people of Palestine and the people that are resisting uh, imperialism and Zionism. So thank you for all your country has done to stand with the Palestinians. And uh, mm -hmm. yes, me for my you. language is so um... <laughs> Hey, we thank you for coming on. You did great. And we're, we're really glad you were here. So thank you very much. All right. That was really, really great to have her. And yeah, great job, Madonna. Uh, thank you for coming on. It was really, really tremendous to have someone from Iran come and join our broadcast tonight. That really added something special. I'm going to show you just some highlights from my film, Iranian Dream. Um, so hold on. I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, put on that part of the film. So here we go. It's very difficult for me to really describe it. I don't think you can really, really understand what went on in that room until you're there. You have to be there to understand it. Um, I was not expecting what I saw in that room, and I don't think I could ever really explain it to anyone. We're here in a very, very sacred place. This is Imam Zodi Ali Akbar, um, and there are celebrations going on. They haven't actually started yet. Celebrations for Imam Mahdi. Uh, he's the 12th Imam in Shia Islam, and he has, has left, but it is believed that he will return at the end of time, along with Jesus Christ. You know, that was a real privilege. I think there are probably, probably millions of Iranians who would love to have sat in that, that couch with me and, and been able to speak to him, you know, because he's such a widely loved figure. But I was able to do that, not as an Iranian, not even as a Muslim, but as someone from the U.S. And that was, that was a real privilege to be able to talk to him. The reason that I have come to Iran is because of a letter written by the Supreme Leader. Uh, the letter was directed at youth like me. Uh, I'm from the United States. And uh, I was wondering if you had read the letter and what it meant to you. در زمان صدر اسلام دعوت به اسلام از جانب پیغمبر یک کلمه بود قولو لا اله الا الله توفلو بگین خدای یکی جز خدا خدایی نیست رستگار بشی و سوال میشه چرا باید بگین خدای یکی غیر از اون خدا خدایی نیست قرآن رو میذاشتن جلوش حرکت رهبر معظم انقلاب خیلی ساده و خیلی عوشمندرن است اگر حرف از اون صداقت باشه اصلا توضیح ندارم اگر هفت دروغ باشه هی باید یه دروغ دیگه بگیم بذاریم اونو جبرانش بکنم این مقدمه رو عرض کردم که بگم من در مورد نامه رهبر معظم انقلاب هیچ چیزی نمیگم فقط میگم حرفشون رو گوش کنیم برین یک بار قرآن رو همینطوری بخونیم جوان های اروپا و امکای شمالی بالاخره آدم هایی هستن که تحصیل کردن کاری نداره به عنوان وقت گذرونی بخونه ضرر نمی کنی فکر کنی یه فیلم داری نگاه میکنی از موجزه قرآن اینه که حتما جذب خواهید شد من خواهیش میگم یار برم بخونه ضرر نمی کنی قیل خوش آمدی Very insightful words and I thank you You're welcome Cardi May, you know, he's known as kind of a very skilled singer. Uh, he, he does this kind of spiritual singing that they do here in Iran. 
it was a brief interaction I had with him, but it was a very, very good interaction. Um, and I felt very welcomed. Uh, you know, as somebody from the United States, as someone who's not a Muslim, to be taken, taken into this, to this holy, holy place, you know, this shrine, to be taken there um, and taken all the way upstairs into the back, back room, you know, where only the performers are, to be sat on a couch, given tea and, and chocolate candies, sitting there and to speak with this man who was such a prominent figure, such a, such a well-known um, spiritual musician, uh, to be able to just sit there and just have a chat with him. You know, he then invited me, even though I'm a Christian and not a Muslim, to join the ceremony. I just ask him if we can take part in the celebration that we have, mm. and of course. something special, something that you can't find anywhere else in the world. And if I try to explain it, if I try to you know, scientifically analyze it, uh, that might take away from its power in a way. I would just urge, urge people, I guess, to just, they'd have to experience it for themselves to really understand it. This room was full of passion, uh, you know, and, and so much, so much love and so much spirituality in that room, so much emotion. Uh, it was like nothing I've ever seen before anywhere. You know, even though I had a translator and so I couldn't hear word for word what he was saying, I could emotionally understand what he was saying. They weren't looking at each other. They weren't looking at each other. It was like it was a, it was a spiritual experience. Being in that room was a spiritual experience. I know after I heard one song, uh, my guide uh, said to me, he said, do you want to go? I said, no, no, I want to stay. I want to see this. I mean, it was like nothing I'd ever felt. There was an energy in that room of all these men, you know, here in Iran, you know, full of energy, you know, having a relationship with God through music. It's a kind of um, spiritual, religious music that is about so much more than, than just the sound. love, you know, that much emotion, I could definitely see myself doing that. And there are other times in my life where I felt this way, you know, full of passion, you know. It's just, it's very deep. When 
I get back, I'm going to read the Quran, Every, all of it, every page. I need to. I need to learn about Islam. I need to understand Islam. Um, I also want to read the Hadith so that I understand about the Imams um, and, and their history. Here we are in a very sacred place where so many people who gave their lives in support of the Islamic Revolution are buried. Uh, these men are shaheed or martyrs, people who gave their lives in support of the Islamic Revolution. You can look at, at all of these faces here. And most of these men are people who signed up. They were people who signed up in the military to defend his, Iran's revolution during the Iraq-Iran War, fought and died uh, to protect the revolution that Imam Khomeini led. But then you come over to these two. These two men, these weren't soldiers. These weren't people who were engaged in any kind of armed fighting. These two men were simply doing what many people do all over the world and doing scientific research. These were scientific researchers. These were people involved in science related to Iran's peaceful nuclear energy program. They were trying to help develop Iran's peaceful nuclear energy program, doing scientific research and investigation. And for that, they were killed by the Israeli government in collaboration with terrorists. They killed these two men for doing nothing but trying to develop peaceful nuclear energy, build up their country, engaging in peaceful scientific research. These men were killed, murdered in their own country simply for trying to engage in scientific research. از بیرون یه چیزای دیگه نشون میدم ولی واردش که بشیم میبینیم که آدم های خیلی خوبی هست ما کشوری هستیم که از زمان حقامنشی به این طرف به کسی حمله نکردیم قبلش هم جایی ننمشته باشه حمله کرده باشیم ولی از خودمون خوب دفاع کردیم و هر اتفاقی هم یفته باز دفاع میکنیم I really want to thank you for taking the time to speak to me. Well, anyway, uh, that is just one selection from the film Iranian Dream that I made when I visited the Islamic Republic of Iran in 2015. Um, and that part is particularly eerie tonight because you heard what that famous Iranian musician said to me, uh, that great singer. What did he say? Um, he said that uh, that that he um, was uh, he, that Iran isn't attacking anybody, but they will defend themselves, right? And that's what Iran is doing. They are defending themselves. And Biden wants to drag our country into World War III because Iran dared to defend itself. Uh, and this is absolutely outrageous. Um, you know, it's it's absolutely outrageous um, that that Joe Biden would even consider the American military being involved in this, right? If Israel, without the permission of the United States, goes and attacks and and uh, uh, kills an Iranian uh, general and attacks an Iranian consulate in Syria, and then Iran responds, any any leader would say, Israel, you're on your own. We don't have the. We don't. We're not backing you up on this. You you you're already bombing Gaza. We're covering your ass on. This is ridiculous. 